Hello there, my fellow minor league nerds. Welcome to our latest Mostly Forgotten Team series. This episode is about the Cleveland Bearcats. Huh, like the University of Cincinnati Bearcats? Huh, no, actually it looks like the Cleveland Bearcats nickname predates Cincinnati's by a few months. Did you know that there were two seasons in which a major league club and a minor league club played a full season in the same city? In fact, they played in the same stadium. It happened in Cleveland in 1914 and 1915 as a result of the Federal League, which was an attempt to bring about a third major league. This episode of Mostly Forgotten Teams is going to tell you that story, of course, focusing on the minor league squad. The Federal League was organized in 1913 as an independent or outlaw minor league. It was not part of the national agreement and therefore did not abide by rules of organized baseball. The league began as a six-team circuit, with all teams located in the Midwest. One of those teams was the Cleveland Green Sox, who played at Luna Park. They were managed by Cy Young, who led them to a second-place finish with a 64-54 and record in what would be his last season in baseball. Most of Young's players were unknown and did not play beyond that season. Four members of the team, though, would play beyond 1913. They were... Outfielder John Potts, who played for Kansas City Packers of the Federal League in 1914. Frank Rooney played 12 games at first base for the Federal League's Indianapolis Hoosiers in 1914, while Harry Jewell pitched for the Brooklyn Tip Tops in 1914, with Gil Britton playing three games for the Pittsburgh Pirates in 1914, going 0 for 12. For the 1914 season, the Federal League expanded to eight teams and declared itself a major league. Teams in Chicago, Kansas City, Indianapolis, Pittsburgh, and St. Louis all returned, while new teams were placed in Baltimore, Brooklyn, and Buffalo. The league attempted to put a team in Cleveland, the sixth most populous city in the country, but that attempt was blocked by Charles W. Summers, owner of the American League Cleveland Naps known today as the Guardians. Summers actually faced competition in the city for just over a month in 1912 from a team called Cleveland Forest City of the United States League. The league only lasted from May 1st to June 5th when it collapsed, with the Cleveland club in 7th place with an 8-13 record. Summers had owned the team since 1900 when it began in the then minor American League, which declared itself a major league in 1901. He was responsible for bringing Sunday baseball to Cleveland in 1911 and was an early proponent of the farm system, establishing a chain of minor league teams in Toledo, New Orleans, Portland, Oregon, Ironton, Ohio, and Waterbury, Connecticut. He didn't want to face competition in Cleveland again, so he worked to keep the Federal League out. To do this, he moved his minor league Toledo Mud Hens of the then AA American Association to Cleveland to share League Park with the Naps. League Park was built in 1891 at Lexington Avenue and East 66th Street and was the only stadium suitable for a major league team in Cleveland. In 1910, Summers completed a major renovation of the ballpark, replacing the wooden grandstand with a concrete double-decker facility. Wooden outfield fences were replaced with concrete. Right field was only 290 feet from home, so he had a tall 40-foot screen installed all the way to center. After being moved to Cleveland, the Mud Hens were renamed the Cleveland Bearcats, playing as the Spiders in 1915. Summers brought in many players with major league experience. During the two years that the teams shared league park, many players were shuttled between the two. Along with fighting to keep the new upstart league out of Cleveland, Summers also had to fight to keep Naps players from being signed away by the Federal League. Teams in the new league had sights set on his incredible pitching staff. Most players stayed in Cleveland after he opened his wallet. But he did lose pitcher Cy Falkenberg, who went 23-10 with a 2.22 ERA in 1913. 
Falkenberg had a great season for the Indianapolis Hoosiers in 1914, finishing 25-16, and 16, again with a 2.22 ERA. He led the Federal League in appearances with 49, starting 43, and had nine shutouts with 236 strikeouts. It appeared that two other pitchers were lured over to the Federal League. In January of 1914, Fred Blanding signed with the Kansas City Packers, who were co-owned by Charles A. Baird, who was the athletic director at the University of Michigan while Blanding was a student. But a week after signing, Blanding had a change of heart, returning to the Naps after being offered a bigger salary, setting off a legal battle between the Federal League and the American and National Leagues as the Packers sought to have the contract he signed honored. The Naps would win in court after their attorneys argued that the reserve clause in Blanding's 1913 contract legally held him to the Naps and he had no right to sign in Kansas City. Pitcher George Kaler also appeared to have been lured away by the Buffalo Blues, with him also having a change of heart, returning his advance money and staying in Cleveland. At the age of 38, Knapp Lajouet returned to lead Summers' team in 1914. He led them to a third-place finish in 1913 with an 86-68 record, nine and a half games behind the pennant-winning Philadelphia Athletics. Outfielder shoeless Joe Jackson also returned to the team. The Naps went on to have a terrible 1914, finishing in last place with a 51 and 102 record. They wouldn't have another 100 plus loss season until 1971. Having two teams sharing League Park meant fans in Cleveland got to see baseball every day of the week. When the Naps went on the road, they turned the park over to the Bearcats. The Bearcats were led by 35-year-old Jimmy Sheckard, who had just finished a 17-year Major League playing career the previous season. Before they became the Bearcats, the media also dabbled with the names Scouts, Spiders, Warriors, and Shecks after their manager. It wasn't until June 21st that they officially became the Bearcats. The American Association schedule was drawn up while they were still the Toledo Mud Hens, and it wasn't altered after the move to Cleveland. They began the season playing their first 24 games on the road, and started off cold. Of their 166 games, only 65 ended up being played at home, seeing them win 40 of them. At the time of their home opener on May 14th, they were in last place, with an 8-16 and record but they went on a 27-12 and 12 run to pull within a game of first place. By mid-season, they were locked in a six-team race for first, with each team within four and a half games of each other. On July 19th, the Bearcats swept a doubleheader from the Milwaukee Brewers in front of 10,000 fans, their largest crowd of the season, to move into first place. Unfortunately, two days later, they were swept in another doubleheader by the Brewers and slid down into third place, slipping further down to fifth place after going 12 and 18 during a month long road trip. When they returned home in September, fans just stopped attending games, and the Bearcats finished in fifth place with an 82 and 81 record. The Naps constantly calling up players throughout the season didn't help their situation. One player of note for the Bearcats that season was Alfred Greasy Neal. He had a decent 13-year baseball career, finishing with a 279 batting average, playing in the majors for both Cincinnati and Philadelphia. He is most remembered for being the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles from 1941 to 1950, leading them to back-to-back -back NFL championships in 1948 and 1949. The 1914 offense was led by Jay Kirk, who split the season between the Naps and the Bearcats, hitting 349 in 74 games for the American Association Club and 273 in 87 games for the American League squad. Outfielder Denny Wiley, who spent the entire season with the Bearcats, hit 316 and had 30 stolen bases. Eight year AL veteran John Schoolboy Knight hit 308. Pitchers, Sad Sam Jones, Lefty James, 
Lynn Brenton, and George Kaler would lead the pitching staff. Kaler made a few appearances for the Naps during that season. Sad Sam Jones pitched one game for the big league team that year, moving up permanently in 1915, continuing to pitch in the American League for the next 21 seasons with six different clubs. Toward the end of the 1914 season, it was rumored that the Kansas City Packers of the Federal League were planning a move to Cleveland, but that ended up not happening, as they would stay where they are. 1915 was not a good year for Charles Summers. Not only had both his teams drawn poorly the previous season, but his non-baseball business faced downturns as well. His liabilities were estimated to be in the range of $1.75 million, roughly just under $55 million today. A committee of bankers stepped in and established cost-cutting measures to keep him afloat. Nap Lajoie was sold to the Philadelphia Athletics, and payroll for his major league squad was cut to $50,000, about $1.5 million today. His scouting staff was also cut, with four senior scouts being released. He was also forced to sell off his interest in the Waterbury team, which had been a success on the field. The Bearcats were officially renamed the Spiders before the start of the 1915 season. The name had been used by the National League team that played in the city from 1889 to 1899. The 1899 Spiders have the distinction of having the worst record in Major League history when they finished 20 and 134. Summers' Major League Club was also renamed before the 1915 season, becoming the Cleveland Indians. The two teams would once again share League Park, which was renamed Summers Park. Shortstop John Schoolboy Knight was hired as a player manager for the Spiders. Both teams would start off poorly that season. Unlike the 1914 season, the Spiders began 1915 at Summers Park, splitting the six-game homestand. The next month and a half did not go well, with them holding a 14-21 record just after Memorial Day. Then, they went on a hot streak, winning seven of their next eight games at home. On June 9th, in a game against the Minneapolis Millers, they came back from a five-run deficit, scoring six runs in the bottom of the ninth to defeat the Millers 12-11. to In the game, Billy Southworth, who was having a fantastic season, hit two triples and two singles. Shortly after the game, he was promoted to the Indians, filling in for an injured shoeless Joe Jackson. Rumors began in June that the Spiders were going to return to Toledo, but that never came about. During a 16-game road trip at the end of June into July, they were no-hit twice within an eight-day period. First, they fell to Dan Triple of the Indianapolis Indians, 6 to nothing, on June 25th and then on July 2nd, one to nothing to Marty O'Toole. Despite the two no-hitters, they found themselves in third place after a successful road trip and swept two doubleheaders from Columbus. But their stay in the first division did not last long, as when they returned home from a long July road trip, they were back in sixth place. The Spiders may have been fortunate enough to begin the season at home, but again, they had long road trips during the season. Just like 1914, they played more games outside of Cleveland than at Summers Park. Even when they were at home, fans did not come out to support them. Once again, only 65 games were scheduled for Summers Park, as, like in 1914, the Indians' schedule took priority. 15 of those games ended up being moved to their opponents' parks, since fans showed such little interest in attending games. The season was also a disaster for the Indians. By the end of August, they were in 7th place, with a 45-74 record. 
things got so bad financially that Summers was forced to trade Shoeless Joe Jackson to the White Sox for an estimated $25,000, around $785,000 today, plus three players from the Sox. Things continued downhill for the Spiders as well. With a week left in this season, they returned home in seventh place with a 62-78 and record. They ended the season by winning five of their last nine games and had to watch the Minneapolis Millers celebrate their American Association pennant victory after falling to them 9-4. to The Spiders finished the season in seventh with a 67-82 and record, 25 and a half games behind Minneapolis and 11 games up on the last place Columbus Senators. Their record at Summers Park was 24 and 26. Things weren't much better for the Indians, who also failed to draw fans, only seeing 159,285 come out. They also finished in seventh place with a 57 and 95 record, suffering their second back to back losing seasons with the first taking place in 1909 and 1910. Once again, many players were shifted between the teams. Jay Kirk hit 268 in 68 games for the Spiders and 310 in 87 games for the Indians, while Denny Wiley hit 311 in 93 games for the Spiders, but only 252 in 45 games for the Major League Club. The Federal League did not return in 1916, with the owners of the American and National Leagues buying out half the owners. Chicago Whales owner Charles Wiegman purchased an interest in the Chicago Cubs, and Phil Ball, owner of the St. Louis Terriers, purchased the St. Louis Browns, with both owners merging their teams into the established clubs. With there no longer being a threat of another major league club moving into Cleveland, and with Summers facing mounting financial issues, he decided to sell the Spiders, who returned to Toledo in January 1916, adopting the name Iron Men before returning to the Mud Hens in 1919. They would remain in Toledo until relocating to Charleston, West Virginia on June 23, 1952, where they became the Charleston Senators, folding following the 1960 season. After the 1964 season, the Richmond Virginians relocated to Toledo, becoming the Mud Hens we know today. Summers retained ownership of the Indians, but ended up having to sell them as well. Joe Birmingham, who had managed the big league club starting in 1912, was fired after 28 games in 1915. He turned around and sued Summers for $20,000 in back wages and damages, with the two settling out of court in February of 1916. By that time, Summers' team had fallen into receivership, with railroad executive James Dunn leading a group to purchase the team. Less than a month later, the new ownership group abandoned its farm system, which would later be developed by Branch Rickey and copied by other major league teams. Well, my fellow minor league nerds, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks for nerding out with me, and as always, be sure to never stop supporting minor league baseball and never stop learning about minor league baseball history. This podcast is part of the Curved Brand Media Network. Here are some of the other members of Curved Brand Media. Hi, this is Ed Rivera of the Data Chronicles. Join me as I interview people just like you and players, coaches, GMs on the path that led you to become a fan of the sport. I'm Paul Caputo, and on the Baseball by Design podcast, I talk to minor league baseball teams, designers, and other super interesting people about what these minor league baseball logos mean. And I talk a little bit about ice cream helmets. What's up, Bucketheads? I'm Anna DiTomaso, and each week on the Baseball Bucket List podcast, I speak with a different fan about their favorite baseball memories, what the game means to them, and what's left to check off on their baseball bucket list. Hey, everyone. It's Eric from the great state of Kansas. This is Johnny from the New Orleans Baby Cakes Memorial Museum. And we are the Earn Fun Average Podcast, where we talk to a variety of guests about their love of baseball and have fun doing it. America, lower your standards. Average is what we do best. This is Patrick and Corey of BaseballMapper.com, and we have made an interactive map to help highlight all baseball teams from the majors 
down to collegiate summer leagues. We want to bring you closer to baseball, so get on the site and find a team near you today. Hey guys, this is Patrick Larson from the Minor League Baseball Hat History Series, and in every episode I go through the history of minor league teams through my personal collection of hats. You can find me on Twitter at at PatLarson1. I hope you guys enjoy. Learn more about Curve Brim Media at curvebrimmedia.com.